Across those five decades, uh, there's been nothing to compare with the past year uh, in policing. Um, what we uh, are seeing, uh, I think, is um, uh, uh, an important question, uh, not only about the future of democratic policing, but some might say uh, the issue of whether there will be a future of uh, policing uh, in, in the shape that we know it in any case. Uh, it was a, a year ago that, um, uh, well, in, in May of uh, 2020, the um, city council of Minneapolis, for example, pledged to abolish the police department as uh, it was uh, operating. And um, there have been major questions uh, about whether other institutions could be doing the same thing that policing does uh, better and with more respect for human rights. And those are all serious questions. And I'm going to try to look at those questions um, in two different ways uh, tonight. Uh, questioning first, uh, what should the future of policing be? What would be the best policies uh, for supporting democracy with good policing, uh, for supporting the rule of law, for uh, achieving uh, racial equity, uh, and uh, certainly public safety uh, against violent crime? Uh, and that's uh, clearly a different question from what's actually going to happen and what will the future of policing be, which would involve predicting some scenarios in which police might become uh, more competent in some ways. They might become less trusted in the process. Uh, both of those things could occur, uh, but a lot may depend heavily on what some would call the accidents uh, of history, uh, much as Tom Stoppard would reflect on his own life if you've been reading about his new biography, because I think critical incidents like what we saw on the 6th of January in Washington, DC, uh, have very long lasting effects. And uh, just to start with that view, I like to see if we can consider the future of policing from the perspective of the birth of policing, uh, as we know it not only in Britain, uh, but also in other countries around the world that have to some degree um, created policing models based on uh, the British model. Uh, although as I have learned based on many years spent in Australia, Canada, uh, New Zealand, other places, uh, the British police model is sui generis and uh, not found anywhere else. And I'd be happy to talk more about that in question time. But let's start first with what happened in Britain before there was a police force uh, under the current model. Um, at the height of the American uh, War of Independence, the uh, uh, Gordon riots occurred in London. Why did they occur? Well, Lord George Gordon uh, was a very strong populist anti-Catholic leader. It's beginning to sound familiar. And when the government of the day said, we don't have enough troops to suppress the rebellious Americans, we need to allow Roman Catholics to join the army. And at that point, Gordon made a fiery speech on the steps of Westminster Palace and the mobs took over the streets of London, burning houses, burning entire city blocks. Finally, the army came in and shot to death 285 rioters, uh, um, hundreds of other people were injured. And uh, Lord Shelbourne and others at the day said, why don't we have a police force like those European countries do? Uh, and that was seen as tyranny. There were lots of reasons not to have a police force. And so no police force was created. Um, some years later, under different conditions, the um, uh, protest in Manchester over the fact that Manchester had a huge population from industrialization, but no members of parliament for that geographic area could be elected. And there was a growing and certainly peaceful uh, demand for uh, the right to vote. 60,000 people gathered in St. Peter's Field uh, in the center of Manchester. Uh, they were peaceful, unlike uh, the London rioters that George Gordon whipped up. And uh, with the, uh, the riot act being read properly to this crowd uh, that probably couldn't hear it, um, the soldiers who had been 
fighting at Waterloo, uh, the yeomanry uh, in their uniform of the Hussars uh, attacked uh, this crowd, leaving 18 dead, hundreds hurt. Uh, the estimates have never been very precise. And um, the, the reaction to Peterloo, uh, which is still going on, recent movie about it, um, the reaction from Lord Liverpool, the prime minister of the day, was to give the people involved medals, the, the magistrates, the soldiers, the police, the constables uh, who were working under the old system before there was a professional police force. Sir Robert Peel, um, working uh, his way up the uh, government ladder and soon to be home secretary, um, uh, alone, apparently, among the conservatives, uh, was quite sickened by the fact that the army was used to attack the police. That was the whole point of Peterloo uh, with the Waterloo soldiers uh, fighting British people as if they were French, as if they were the enemy and the opposition when all they were doing was to ask if they could participate in government. Well, um, participate in government uh, they did uh, eventually, but not until um, Peel had actually designed the Metropolitan Police hired 2,000 officers to launch it in 1829, and promptly saw uh, the Whigs take over with Lord Melbourne as the Home Secretary, who uh, <laughs> continued the, the habit of saying, if you're gonna have a protest over getting a right uh, to vote, um, which was about to happen in cold bath fields in London, uh, we're not gonna let you. And so he ordered the police to suppress the demonstration, which was peaceful, um, and to uh, not allow the gathering to occur. Uh, the two police commissioners of the day um, argued with the Home Secretary, Melbourne, that they shouldn't take that action. Um, they were ordered by Melbourne to do it. And um, uh, Sir Richard Maine, a Cambridge graduate, uh, a lawyer, and a very careful man took notes of the meeting. The, the event occurred and no civilians were killed according to the historical record, but a police officer was beaten to death. 16 people were tried for the uh, murder of the police officer and they were acquitted by a jury of their peers on the grounds that the police had no basis for attacking those citizens and that they were acting in self-defense. At that point, Melbourne criticized the police, said, no, no, that's right. They should never have broken up the meeting. Uh, and uh, Maine came before parliament and said, hang on, uh, this guy's lying, uh, here's the notes. Uh, it sounds a lot like the FBI director in his meeting with Trump. Here's the notes. Parliament uh, cleared the police. And at that point, the police were put into a constitutionally uh, unique position in the history of government, uh, which arguably they still occupy. It's called the position of operational independence. And this UK principle, which is not observed very much uh, in the US um, uh, or even in some other uh, former British colonies, uh, like Australia, not to the same degree as I've seen in the UK. Uh, and under this principle, the police have judge-like powers, which means that elected uh, members of the executive or legislative branch cannot give the police orders. They can't tell them who to investigate or who not to investigate. They can't tell them who to arrest or where to put police patrols. Um, the chief constable gets to make those decisions. It's been disputed and fought out in the courts over two centuries in the UK. Uh, and remains very strong. So uh, when a recent dispute between a cabinet member and a chief constable over uh, arresting people for pulling down a statue in Bristol and throwing it into the harbor, uh, when that emerged, um, it was quite clear that the chief constable was going to defy uh, demands that people be arrested because in his view, uh, it would have been uh, not in the public interest to try to make arrests with a few officers present and a very large uh, crowd, uh, as well as the larger context of keeping the peace in the community, which since 1361 in the Magistrates Act, uh, the obligation of uh, the uh, law enforcement branch of government has been to keep the peace, not to enforce the law, which is interesting because in the US, nobody talks about police, they talk about law enforcement. And in the United Kingdom, law enforcement is a tool, but it's not a purpose. The purpose is to keep the peace. You use the tool when it serves the purpose. You don't use the tool when it doesn't serve the purpose. And that helps to add clarity to the idea of operational independence, which is uh, lacking in, in the US, uh, where we have political appointments by mayors uh, of chiefs of police 
uh, who receive orders from their mayor, sometimes very particular orders about which officers to assign to which jobs or which officers to promote. Um, even in, in uh, Queensland, Australia, there was a, a promotion of a, uh, a corrupt police officer to deputy commissioner and um, a, uh, a senior officer in that police force resigned in protest. Uh, this um, person who was promoted by a political process uh, was uh, later knighted uh, again by a political process and then found to be corrupt, put in prison, stripped of his knighthood uh, and thereby providing one more example of how uh, outside of Britain uh, under uh, what seemed to be British traditions, there's still uh, lots of political inter interference uh, in policing that's possible. I wouldn't want to comment on the current situation in Australia, uh, but I would say that the FBI director's uh, case with uh, the president of the United States in 2017, where the, the president, um, according to the FBI director of the time, asked him to close the investigation against the national security director, former director at that point, uh, Mr. Flynn, and, and he refused. Uh, then there were lots of other denials, but the whole point was, can the president tell the FBI director what to do? Um, and others might say, well, under FDR, uh, J. Edgar Hoover was so powerful as an FBI director, uh, he was almost telling the president what to do, in part because he had some uh, scandalous information about Mrs. Roosevelt that he was using to blackmail the president of the United States. So the principle of operational independence is not necessarily uh, a perfect one. And if you have very powerful police directors uh, uh, like J. Edgar Hoover, uh, you have lots of other problems along with that. But we just have to understand that when there is all of this power about using the monopoly on legitimate use of force by the state, which is invested in the police force, uh, you have a, a very great challenge of figuring out what's the best way to manage that to support democracy and the rule of law. But by 1887, with 14,000 uh, police officers working in London and 10,000 marchers, uh, along with 30,000 uh, uh, observers, uh, on a November day, uh, a Sunday in 1887, the first bloody Sunday involving issues uh, in Ireland, uh, what uh, happened was uh, that nobody was killed. And uh, that's not the way this event is uh, remembered, but if you put it in the context of similar critical incidents for the future of democratic policing or the history of democratic policing, uh, what I think you find is the most remarkable thing about Bloody Sunday is that a whole lot of people had their heads cracked open with nightsticks and nobody died. 400 people were arrested, um, a whole pattern of protests in Trafalgar Square ensued, where, uh, whereby for years there were major demonstrations and uh, lots of arrests and lots of confrontation with an unarmed police force, which was created by Peel to be unarmed, to be the people. The police are the people and the people are the police is the way that one of his uh, ghostwriters uh, put it. And uh, nothing could show that better than the way in which the preservation of property and the preservation of order was managed by the police under a conservative government, but with lots of historical record that any attempts by the home office to tell the police how to do that were rebuffed and that the police were operating with this kind of operational independence by which their main concern was to minimize harm and to keep the peace as much as possible. And, and indeed, on the question of hunger, the question of home rule for Ireland, all of those issues that brought George Bernard Shaw, uh, William Morris, the designer who'd actually helped to design uh, parliament uh, or recent uh, additions to it, uh, members of parliament themselves were among the marchers who uh, had the confrontation with the police and uh, were the subjects uh, of the arrests that were made. Um, despite all of those people having a very good policy argument, the question for the police, as I've often heard it put since my youth, uh, since I was marching against the Vietnam War and um, serving in a group of people trying to keep the, the demonstrators uh, from trying to invade the White House. Uh, and I was standing there with a white armband at the time when Abby Hoffman came up to me and uh, we said we wouldn't let him buy and he uh, called us pigs and trumped off. Um, 
I, I think the whole question of whose side are you on is uh, the challenge for democratic policing, much as it is for the referee in this Texas incident in which the football players didn't like what the referee said on the left-hand side, and they're coming out to tell the referee what they think, at which point they assault the referee. Well, that's exactly what happened, of course, to Brian Sicknick, who sadly was killed uh, uh, from the uh, bear spray that was used against him by a rioter uh, on January 6th. This is a Capitol Police officer who had uh, a military uh, history uh, fighting in Asia and uh, who voted for Trump in 2016, as he told Nancy Pelosi's um, uh, uh, chief of staff who came through his um, uh, metal detector station every day. Um, and he actually uh, helped her weep over Hillary Clinton's loss uh, the day uh, it happened. Uh, and she recalled all this in a Washington Post story, uh, as well as the fact that Sicknick was against impeachment. So here you have a, a professional police officer. Um, and if you ask the question, whose side are you on? What Sicknick would say is, well, if you're asking me as a citizen, I'm on the side of President Trump. If you're asking me as a police officer, I'm not on your side if you want to invade the capital of the United States and commit mayhem and, and potentially murder. And that's how he died. So what does that mean about the four police officers in Munich in 1923 when Hitler staged the Beer Hall Putsch. Uh, as you can see at the bottom of the plaque, Frederick Fink, Nicholas Holweg, Max Schobert, um, Rudolf Schraut, these are all people who were killed by the crowd uh, in trying to carry out the orders of the duly elected Chief Minister of Bavaria, uh, who was trying to stop a fairly well-coordinated effort to overthrow the Weimar uh, government, um, which eventually happened in a different story but in that particular uh, event of 1923, uh, Adolf Hitler got arrested by the Bavarian police and put into prison after he was duly sentenced in a court of law where he wrote Mein Kampf. Uh, but it didn't happen without police officers dying, not because they were on Hitler's side or they were on the communist side uh, or other things that were going on in Berlin uh, throughout most of the Weimar uh, Republic, uh, but rather because they were trying to uphold the rule of law. And that is exactly what the Washington police were doing in December of 2020 in uh, the Million MAGA March in which the police having learned a lot from the Black Lives Matter protests uh, in the summer in which the president of the United States actually ordered um, the crowds to part so he could stand in front of uh, a church and tear gas was actually used to allow the president to walk through. Uh, that, was, that was the context. And separating the Proud Boys uh, in one part of Washington from the Antifa and the Black Lives Matter protesters provoked the Proud Boys to say in a way that was overheard by and quoted in the Washington Post, congratulations, now both sides hate you cops. So in a way, that's the future of democratic policing as well as it's been the past. It's the ability to take the position of being the referee uh, whose loyalty is not to one side or the other, but to the rules of the game. And that's a very nice narrative uh, for police as defenders of democracy that unfortunately for the way I want the world to be, it's very hard to reconcile that narrative of police as defenders of democracy with other kinds of histories of the police. Uh, certainly in the country of my birth, uh, the histories of systemic racism, which some present as the only story, the origin story being that the police were created to uh, catch runaway slaves, and that was the only thing that they did, uh, is totally contradicted by um, decades of scholarship about the creation of the Boston Police Department, the New York Police Department, the Philadelphia Police Department, and, and so on. Nonetheless, there are critical incidents of racism that stand out, uh, not just racism, but massacre and slaughter of black people by police on the grounds of those people being the race they were. And those incidents um, 
uh, even though we might say they constitute misleading heuristics, uh, so that whenever you think of police, you think racist. Uh, and that's the way Daniel Kahneman, uh, the Nobel Prize winning behavioral psychologist, uh, would put it in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, all of that is true, but it's not the only story. And the fact that the police, as I only learned in the last several years, the police systematically massacred black people uh, in the South after the Civil War under Andrew Johnson's reconstruction. Uh, Johnson not believing in the 14th Amendment or in equal rights uh, for uh, uh, African Americans, um, uh, let the police of the defeated states um, commit major massacres uh, in Memphis, in New Orleans. Um, later on, uh, after um, the uh, attempt at reconstruction under Grant uh, was long over, Wilmington, North Carolina had an elected government uh, with black officials, with uh, uh, black police officers, and uh, they were all overthrown in a local coup, uh, which involved killing many black people um, uh, in the guise of support from uh, people who were about to become police in the coup, all white. And one of the uh, leaders of this group going on to become elected governor of North Carolina, uh, a tradition that I grew up with in the 1960s in the United States. And recalling that history, just as we recall the history of slavery, is a constant uh, reminder of this challenge for a democracy to maintain a neutral referee in the status of the police so that you don't see George Floyd being suffocated uh, by Derek Chauvin, uh, a police officer who never would have been allowed to serve 18 years in the British police service, um, I can say uh, with a great deal of evidence. Uh, but one who's about to go to trial this week in Minneapolis and whose case will again come to dominate the narrative of American police as uh, racists and the only way to deal with them, as uh, Alex Vitale, the author of the book, The End of Policing, uh, said, is not to reform the police, but to abolish the police. Well, um, there's an another narrative here, which is that there are countries that are more or less democratic <clears throat> that in uh, our lifetimes have seen uh, not the police being abolished, but democracy being abolished. And if we look at what's happened in, in the last several decades in Turkey, uh, where the police themselves were uh, subjected to a, a massive purge um, after uh, there were uh, certainly uh, lots of questions about where police loyalties uh, lay in relation to Turkish politics. Nonetheless, it's a striking uh, demonstration of the capacity of, a, of an autocracy to take over a police institution and to make it serve its own purposes. Uh, Hong Kong, where Heather Strang, my wife and I have been doing our best since 2015 to try to reinforce the democratic uh, rule of law tradition that was guaranteed under the negotiation of the uh, handover in, eight, in 1997, um, has a uh, 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 situation that I think nobody could get out of in which uh, a massive amount of military force uh, is backing up uh, the complete destruction of democracy that was completed uh, last week. What's going on in Burma uh, is uh, perhaps no good example of a democracy that was taken away, um, but perhaps it was an example of uh, an attempt to construct what looked more like a democracy uh, but which, which was not tolerable by the autocracy. Uh, and now 38 people have been shot to death uh, in Burma for peaceful demonstrations. Um, and shooting people uh, in demonstrations is certainly not limited uh, to those countries. Uh, recent examples in South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya uh, are uh, major uh, demonstrations of uh, the degree to which those nations as democracies um, or not can uphold uh, the rule of law. Just as the 1,000 people a year shot and killed by the United States police under conditions that are generally illegal in the United Kingdom, uh, but not uh, in the US, 
um, uh, not even with the support of one of Obama's appointees to the Supreme Court, uh, who approved of shooting somebody involving a knife situation in, in uh, a way that would not be allowed in the UK. Um, we, we have this problem of what do you do when the democracy or the power of the land is trying to control the police, uh, not to uphold human rights, and certainly not to be a referee to allow both sides to express their views and to compete in fair and free democratic uh, elections. Uh, rather, the police become uh, the pawns in the game. And so we, we are led, uh, as we look towards the future, with two truths I would suggest to you. One is uh, that the police cannot resist the massive force of the military uh, when autocracy uh, trumps professional policing. That said, and for most of the countries that people in this webinar are living in, uh, the good news is that the police can uphold democracy against autocrats as long as they don't have any control of the military, which is what I think we've just seen in Washington in January of this year. Uh, I don't think anybody in the United Kingdom would consider um, uh, contemplating the, the kind of effort uh, that uh, uh, was developing in the United States and may still be developing uh, with uh, the rise of right-wing terrorism, uh, which is not a problem that is limited in the United States and a very substantial proportion of terrorists in British prisons uh, are identified with right-wing uh, ideologies. Um, but again, the, the British police have taken a very strong position against any appearance of taking sides in any of these uh, political uh, debates. And it's consistent with an idea I want to leave you with uh, from somebody I've never met, but whose work I've read, Professor David Sklansky at Stanford Law School, who makes a very cogent case from a predominantly critical perspective on the police, I'd have to say. Um, but his challenge to the police and the idea of police reform is to make the mission of the police the attack on illegitimate hierarchy of all kinds. And if we think broadly, that includes the criminal uh, in a dominant position over a victim who is less powerful than the criminal at the moment that a knife or a gun is pointed at the potential uh, a victim of an injury uh, in relation to a robbery or rape or other uh, serious crime. Uh, in general, uh, dominance of men versus women has been a hierarchy that police have uh, not always uh, eagerly or willingly, but they've certainly been drawn into um, in recent years with the extension of laws such as coercive control and um, other ways in, in which the, the police have been enforcing um, the rule of law consistent with uh, what are called uh, under the rules of the program for teaching um, apprentices that uh, were associated with at Cambridge. Uh, they're called British values. I think they're broader than British values, um, but they certainly apply to the growing and I think very serious effort to combat modern slavery uh, in the UK. Um, and, and again, to remove the dominance of the enslavers versus the slaves. Um, and also to look at differential homicide rates, as we've been studying lately, under which Black Britons are killed at a rate of homicide victimization five times higher than White Britons. And that differential, uh, that inequality of murder risks, uh, to me, is far more serious than the issues around stop and search, which um, I'll, I'll be doing a webinar on fairly soon, and I won't get into now. Um, but I do want to say that the idea that the fundamental job of the police in, in attacking illegitimate hierarchy uh, echoes a, a very uh, deeper book, a, a more rounded treatment of policing in 1977 by the late Herman Goldstein, uh, whose um, seriousness of purpose in reviewing the full range of things police are asked to do not from the standpoint of defunding the police, but from the standpoint of setting priorities and to make the defense of human rights and this idea of illegitimate hierarchy uh, one of the central um, pillars for making those tough decisions about what the police should be doing 
and what they should not be doing. So I leave you uh, with the question of the future of democratic policing, uh, as, as I often am about many things, and that's guardedly optimistic, uh, because the UK certainly remains very strong in its future of policing with a highly professional uh, police leadership culture that has the blessing of operational independence, but also the, um, the external threat of a regulatory body that's been around since 1856, which is the Inspector General of Constabulary. And I did testify before the um, Obama task force that we needed something like that in every state in the US. If anybody is here from the US and you wanna pick one issue for police reform, it would be creating an Inspector General of Police who can decertify police departments and decertify officers, as well as doing something that this George Floyd bill may do is to create a national database of people who have been fired from police jobs to keep them from being hired uh, in new police jobs. Ultimately, what keeps British policing strong, I think, is class unity uh, between the police and the police themselves, uh, which is uh, not available in the US um, if we say class takes the place uh, uh, in the UK of what race uh, occupies in the US. And this fundamental division over race uh, is a major fault line in US policing. Um, but again, I'm guardedly optimistic. I think Biden's gonna fund a lot of efforts to professionalize the police with better training, better regulation, possibly even healthier hours. Um, most of the horrible incidents in Minneapolis recently have involved people who are work working way too many hours uh, of uh, second uh, job employment, which is again, heavily uh, regulated and controlled in, in the UK. So that I would say that um, uh, among other things, uh, British police get more sleep than American police do. Uh, where does that leave us um, in terms of other countries? Well, um, on Monday, uh, I begin to chair a committee of the National Academy of Science uh, on the best evidence to advance um, police reform in the global uh, security and justice sectors um, all over uh, the, the world, uh, especially the 90 countries that are being supported by the US State Department. And maybe the efforts of countries like Britain and Europe, Norway, et cetera, that have been trying to develop police reform in other nations can design a better narrative of the police for the future. But as I say, with, uh, without any nationalism, because I'm not even a UK citizen yet, uh, although I hope you'll come to my citizenship ceremony, I'm not giving up my US citizenship, and I am looking forward to a future in which all countries can benefit from the growing uh, interest in learning and improvement uh, that I see in all the police I'm um, fortunate to come into contact with. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.